Okay, this meeting is being recorded. <laughs> um, I just want to introduce my graduate student, Samantha Camacho, who's going to be helping out with some logistical things. She's already put a link to my slides in the chat, so feel free to open that up and um, re refer to that as a resource ongoingly. So let me share my screen so we can take a look at the agenda for today and get started. Um, and by the way, it is very foggy here in Berkeley right now, but it will probably clear up somewhat as the morning goes on. So I'm a professor of teacher education at the University of San Francisco. And uh, our agenda for today is the following. So we're going to be moving quite quickly. Um, we're going to push on through without taking a break. Of course, feel free to take a break whenever you need to. Um, we'll have two breakout room activities and then Q&A and feedback at the end. So um, I just want to name a couple of influences on my work, recent influences on what I'm going to be presenting today. Um, one is definitely a major research project that I did in 2016 to 2018 that you'll be hearing about. Um, and one of the things that I learned in that research project is that teaching controversial issues is approached in a variety of ways, depending on lots of different contextual factors and you know who the individual teachers are and teacher educators are. And at the same time, um, a lot has happened around controversial issues in the US since that project was finished. And so current developments in the US um, is also influencing what I present today. And um, let's see, I've been studying democracy education for many, many years since I inherited a democratic classroom as a middle school educator. And um, I've been at the University of San Francisco for over 20 years now and teach a variety of courses. This summer, I'm really pleased to be piloting a course called Teaching Controversies. So um, I'm sure you'll learn more about me as we go further, but for now, I would love it if you could write in the chat box your name, uh, where you work, and your role at that institution, and your national context, so we can get a sense of who's in the Zoom room, and then feel free to open the slide deck. So um, let's see. I just want to start with some guidelines for discussion that I use with my students while you're uh, writing in the chat. Um, I got this set of guidelines from my colleague, Associate Dean Colette Can, who's done a lot of work on dialogue at the University of Michigan. So the acronym is ASPIRE, and A stands for assuming that people have good reasons for what they have to say, and at the same time, it's important that everybody acknowledges the impact that their words have on other people. S stands for uh, people speaking one at a time, making room and taking room, as we say at USF, step up, step back. P, participating with an open mind and being willing to take different perspectives. I is for using I statements. R is about respecting confidentiality and taking risks. E is escuchar in Spanish means to listen. We want to listen to understand other people and also have empathy with ourselves and with others. So um, as I was saying, I've been very influenced with what's been going on in the United States since I got back from conducting my research. And over the last 16 months, we have confronted one crisis after another. So there's the pandemic and all the controversies that that has raised for us. There was the murder of George Floyd uh, a little over a year ago and the racial justice uprisings across the country that came out of that. Um, and then there was the insurrection at the Capitol on January 6th. So there are so many controversial questions that have emerged from all of this. And I think it's made us uh, educators all aware that teaching controversial issues is more urgent than ever. And at the same time, as Lee was referring to earlier, it's probably more scary than it ever has been before because of all the controversies that are swirling around the nation and the globe. Um, what's happening in the education space also contributes to this urgency and anxiety. 
So there are a number of uh, state legislatures in Republican dominated states in the US that have been pushing legislation against anti-racist curriculum. Uh, they're using the term critical race theory um, to sort of rally their troops. And teachers um, had a day of action on uh, this past Saturday to push back that this is an ongoing controversy over the curriculum. So um, why teach controversial issues, especially at this moment? We know from research that discussion of controversial issues in an open classroom climate leads to increased political knowledge, interest, engagement, and efficacy among young people. Um, those studies are both in the US and international. Uh, Living with Controversy is a document that was created through the Council of Europe about six years ago that gets into the rationales for teaching controversial issues and provides lots of practical and conceptual tools for doing that work. And then most recently, the National Academy of Education in the US came out with a major report based on lots and lots of research, interdisciplinary research on educating for civic reasoning and discourse. So although teaching controversial issues has its home in social studies education and citizenship education primarily, it's really being picked up by other disciplines as well. So I'll tell you a little bit about the research project that I conducted. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of really great scholarship on teaching controversial issues that's been done internationally, but there was virtually no research on how teacher educators prepare their pre-service teachers to do this really important work. So I decided to study four teacher educators um, and their pre-service teachers located at four universities in three different countries, two in Northern Ireland, one in England, one in the Midwest. Um, I started my study just a few months after the Brexit vote and uh, the work was funded by the Spencer Foundation. And what I did was I um, went over to your side of the pond twice during the academic year and then I was in the Midwest twice as well here in the US. I was a participant observer in um, methods courses taught by the four teacher educators so I sat in on their classes. I did a series of three interviews with each of the teacher educators and 15 pre-service teachers over the course of more than a year because I wanted to follow the pre-service teachers through their school placements. And I collected lots of documents, including course materials, program descriptions, student teaching lessons, and course assignments. And out of all this data analysis, I developed two grounded theories one I call contain risk taking, which I'll talk about in a moment. And the other is called adaptive uptake of pedagogical tools, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So the theory of contained risk taking, basically what I found across the four teacher educators is that you know in these um, very polarized locations, they encouraged their pre-service teachers to explore controversial issues with their students. And they provided them with lots of tools for doing it in many different ways. But at the same time, they, they taught a set of strategies for containing the risks that can accompany teaching controversial issues. So we know from research and our own experience that teachers can be very anxious about potential conflict in the classroom, inflammatory speech among students, and then recriminations from parents and sanctions from administrators, especially in really contentious political times. And so across these four teacher educators, I identified four different strategies that they taught for doing this work, but at the same time, doing it in ways that protected teachers and students and were really thoughtful and reflective and well-informed and pragmatic at the same time. So these strategies are cultivating a supportive environment, preparing thoroughly, thinking through teacher stance on the issues, communicating proactively with students, parents, and administrators, selecting authentic issues and framing them in thoughtful ways, choosing resources and pedagogies that challenge assumptions and include diverse voices and perspectives, 
guiding discussion in fruitful directions and addressing emotions. So we're gonna get into two of these strategies in some more depth. And the first one is selecting authentic issues. So it's really important. I think there's a lot of confusion because there are so many controversies swirling around in society these days, it's really important to go back to some scholarship to define, well, what is a controversial issue in terms of what we would even think about bringing to the classroom? So I go back to Stradling, Nocter, and Baines who defined controversial issues as those problems and disputes that divide society and for which significant groups within society offer conflicting explanations and solutions based on alternative values. So for example, how should COVID vaccines be distributed? Controversial issue. Who has the strongest claim to the land that is now Israel and Palestine? Um, Diana Hess in her book, Controversy in the Classroom, defined controversial political issues as questions of public policy that spark significant disagreement. So in the US this past spring, there was so much controversy right here in Berkeley about the question, should schools reopen and under what conditions? And then uh, Stuart Foster defined controversial issues in history, in the discipline of history as sensitive questions related to contested histories. So for example, who is responsible for the Rwandan genocide would be a controversial issue in history. I think part of the confusion that's going on these days is conflating topics with issues. So I'm gonna suggest that we think about issues in terms of open questions that we, wanna, that we want students to explore from multiple perspectives. So a topic would be racism and that can be very controversial. But what we wanna to bring to the classroom as a controversial question might be something like, when and how should racist speech be censored? Another controversial topic is policing. Um, a, a question that we might bring is, should police departments be defunded? A third controversial topic is the coronavirus. But a specific question would be, when should restrictions be lifted? Another topic is refugees. We might pose the question, what is a fair refugee policy? And then feel free to put ideas about this last topic, environmental justice, in the chat box. What would be a good controversial question to bring to the classroom that you would want students to explore about environmental justice? So going even deeper into framing controversial issues for the classroom, we really need to think about what's an open issue versus a settled issue. And this gets very, very controversial. There's a lot of disagreement about this. Hess wrote about this in her book, um, Controversy in the Classroom as well. So it's a major contribution of her work. So open questions have multiple competing and reasonable views to explore. They have not been decided. Students should draw their own conclusions. And an example would be, should schools punish students for cyberbullying that happens off campus? So there are reasonable views on either side of that debate. A settled question would be, should women have the right to vote? That was settled a century ago. Um, it was, may have been, a, a settled question may have been open in the past, but it's been settled by law, consensus, scientific research, et cetera. And there are questions that may be open or settle depending on the context, right? So the question, should students be allowed to wear religious symbols at school? Um, I think in France, that's very controversial. Um, in the US, in most contexts, that would not be controversial. So it's really important to think about, you know, what we think of as open versus settled and what is really contextual depending on where the school is located and what kind of school it is. So what I'd like to do now is um, have you all get a chance to talk in breakout groups about this uh, issue, this question of how to select and frame controversial questions that you want to explore with students in the classroom. 
And I just pulled something off of Human Rights Watch. These are a whole list of topics related to um, human rights that are going on in, in the UK. So feel free in your groups to talk about controversial questions around one or more of these topics or topics in your own curriculum that you think should be explored in the classroom. So um, I'm asking you to actually discuss in your breakout group and post your ideas on this Padlet so you can get into that through the link. Um, just click on the plus sign and you can create your own post-it, write something and then it will show up. So I'm gonna stop the share here, find out if anybody has any questions before we get into the breakout groups. Okay, Lee, do you wanna go ahead and do that? Yeah, I'm, okay, so the Padlet um, link has just gone in the chat if people want to follow that. And how long are you going to ask people to? Well, why don't we take 10 minutes to both talk about the questions and post together in the breakout groups? Okay, great. We'll see you in the rooms. Terrific. Still coming back. Okay, I think that's everyone. Um, so why don't we share out a little bit about questions that you came up with and also feel free to put them in the chat. But um, would anybody like to share verbally with the group? Any question that or questions that your group came up with? Emily. Yeah, um, I, I, seeing as I, I hate the silence, so I'm going to speak into it. <laughs> um, we, we were in group four, we began to put a few ideas onto um, Padlet. We didn't get very far because obviously controversial take is issues take a long time to think about, even just asking questions about them. So we went from the bottom to the top and we chose around foreign policy. We thought, let's go in with the um, COVID vaccine angle, you know, how does our government decide who's most deserving of that vaccine aid, if at all, you know, around like, should it prioritize Commonwealth countries given, you know, our history and what we owe to other countries and that kind of like meaty <laughs> and post-colonial questions. And then, um, you know, and GDPR and that kind of thing, how do we prioritize? And then on counterterrorism, we got, we, again, the kind of looking at the angle of, um, you know, who defines what a terrorist is and who a terrorist is, what's the age of kind of criminal responsibility when it comes to terrorism in terms of the thinking of um, Shamima Begum, a pupil here in the UK who was groomed and then um, went to Syria and then, you know, and all of that story. And then, um, you know, uh, should then, sh does the government have the right to strip citizenship from people accused and convicted of um, terrorist, you know, offenses? So we got that far, that was already, yeah, quite a, a, a lot, but other people might have started from the top. So. That's wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing. Anybody else from a different group? Hiya. Nikki. Hello. Uh, we were also discussing counterterrorism, but we kind of, um, uh, we, we talked about um, how to approach the actual topic. So we, we talked about um, starting with researching the various perspectives, so asking the children to, to research those perspectives. Um, it does. It would involve um, a lot of prep by the educator. However, um, we um, Balvi in our group works for Prevent, and she told us about a group called Select Solutions Not Size. Um, they've, got, they've got a load of stuff on on YouTube or on the internet, which you can use in class, or you can actually invite speakers in to talk from the Palestinian side or to talk from the Israeli side. Um, we we kind of discussed that uh, it's really about. Uh, getting the kids to research or getting the kids to see the different sides and starting from a position of empathy with, um, uh, no, not starting with a position of empathy, sorry, uh, in, in educating themselves and us, us educating the kids before they get their emotions involved. So not to start with emotion. Mm -hmm. 
Have, have I missed anything out, uh, Balbir and Estelle? We, we had a bit of a debate about whether we should start from the pupil zone point of view first or whether we should look into the different sides second. I think we kind of fell on the side of uh, research, but then emphasised that it's about understanding where the sides are coming from and then using this particular organisation called Solutions Not Sides, which sounds fabulous. Yeah. Can I just say that we also discuss it with the different kind of pedagogic approaches that you would use um, if you were with primary children or secondary or whatever. So that there would be a different layer. You could still get the message across, but the resources might be adapted and you might have different. Well, I would have different pedagogic approaches anyway. Thank you. So. I'll, put, I'll put the I'll put it in the chat box the organization and that's not the only one there's many others as well thank you mm -hmm. thank you so much sounds like a really rich discussion anybody else want to share one more group okay well feel free to put any other questions that you came up with in the chat so we will move on to um, the next activity or the next uh, topic here. I'm gonna share my screen again. So another element of the framework that I shared with you um, is about choosing good resources and pedagogical methods. And so I, we just started having this conversation, I think, but please feel free to put your favorite methods or the methods that you use in the chat box so other people can see. Um, Discussion is at the heart of teaching controversial issues, but there's a lot more involved in terms of different approaches to discussion and also other kinds of activities. So here are some popular methods, um, structured academic controversy, which we'll be seeing an example of in a minute, a walking debate, town hall, simulation, ranking and sorting activities, and source analysis. So, um, The student teachers that I interviewed, um, well, not all of them, but a number of them did use structured academic controversy. And uh, structured academic controversy has been found to be very popular with teachers in many different countries. The Deliberating in a Democracy Project um, engaged in professional development with people from several different countries and did research on uh, what happened when they used SACS and teachers reported that students really enjoyed it and they felt like it was easier to use than some other methods for discussion. It's very structured. So we're gonna watch this uh, nine minute video and see how structured academic controversies are being used in this particular setting in Chicago public schools. The purpose of a structured academic controversy or a SAC is to give students a reading that presents two sides, uh, or sometimes more, but generally two sides of a controversial topic. Ask them to do a close reading and identify the arguments that are being made by both sides. And then come in and with a partner, dissect those and pick out and discuss what they think are the strongest arguments, and then take turns essentially teaching them to each other. The idea being to disinvest students from one side or another so that they don't see it as a debate or an argument in which whatever side you've been aside must be the side that wins and instead uh, allow students to explore those ideas, make sure that they understand them from both sides so, so they will teach one side, uh, hear the other, and then switch and teach the other side. Notice that there is no D debate up here, okay? Which tells you this is not a debate. It is a deliberation. So what does it mean to deliberate? Deliberation is more like a discussion rather than a debate. So like with the debate, you're trying to like counter argue the opposing side, but in a discussion, we're being open to both viewpoints. Brilliant. So you have, so a deliberation is the idea that we are listening and open-minded to both sides. 
and that we are contributing to um, those viewpoints with information that we have. Here is what's going to happen. We're actually going to dive into the SAC with these norms in mind, that our purpose today is to um, hear both sides and hear different feedback and offer unique perspectives, sometimes if it's not even our perspective, uh, that we're respecting everyone's opinions, um, both in how we agree and how we disagree, that we understand that we strengthen our own argument and our understanding when we hear other points of view, um, and that our discussion should be based in the idea that um, hearing everyone contributes to our understanding of what's going on and our own opinion. The idea of using um, suffrage at 16, which is an issue that is very actively being advocated for, it was really about trying to bring in a, a relevant current issue so that students would have space to connect uh, what they're learning to an issue that is very much uh, applicable to their lives. It really opens up your mind to different opinions and different views. Because normally, when I do like a Socratic seminar, I have one view and I stick to that. But I think today was the first time where I've actually like kind of flip flop between different views. <laughs> Okay, so those are our top three, and then we can even tie them into other perspectives to get an overall understanding of the maturity level and stuff like that. A side, you are going to present your information first. B side, you are going to write down what you hear A side saying, okay, without interruption. All right, so side A, please present your information to side B. Teenagers already have citizen participation. Like, even if we don't have the right to vote, students are already in, like, political organizations or causes that affect public policy already. And these are all activities of citizen participation. And so if older teenagers are already in this, then they should have the ability to vote. Side B. You are going to present your um, three points now. So we'll do the same thing, just with side B. Generally, they need require parental consent for ma most major life decisions. So technically, they're really not holding um, their own decisions because they need someone as a higher um, age level and a higher maturity as it represents itself that they need a consent to further do whatever they decide to do and approve of whatever their decisions may be. And I want you to answer the deliberation question. Where you are right now, what do you think the answer to that is? What were the two pieces of evidence that you heard that really swayed your opinion? Now, remember I said, evidence is definitely what you just exchanged and what you read about, but it is also your lived experience that matters. So you can now welcome that into part of what you're gonna be using in order to share your thinking with the other people uh, at the table. And SAC, it's, you know, there's a lot of gray area. There's not necessarily a, um, is a binary decision. So it just goes to show how issues in the real world aren't necessarily just, you know, true or false there. Um, there's, a, there's a deeper ground to them and they should be explored. So the idea is that this is how the world works. This is how human beings are, right? We have different opinions. And when we come together, can we actually come up with a solution? Can we deliberate, hear each other, and think what is the best policy that we can come up with based on our points of view? And this is hard because sometimes that means negotiating. Would you be okay with the fact that we said, like, no, they shouldn't be allowed to vote, but however, like, I feel like the 16 for half of would be, like, a compromise. Kind of how we take back how it's, like, different generations and different issues, so it's, like, it should be implemented, but also people don't have, like, that extensive knowledge as, like, an adult would do you need to, like, know more about it. Well, so, so let me ask you a question. Why do those things have to come with voting? I mean, you're absolutely right. That's absolutely why 18 year olds try to protest against the Vietnam War and being drafted. So you're 100% correct. But why do those things have to come 
with it. I feel by saying like you're voting, like you're saying that you are mature enough to make a decision as to who should be representing you and who should be in office in the country. Mm -hmm. And that's that's like very much an adult decision. Like if you have the right to, if you can make that decision for yourself. Well, the reason behind it was that a lot of the um, evidence was that most 16 year olds have a lot of dependence on their parents. So there could be um, a little bit of not them understanding that they should vote for who they want instead of their parents. Because that would be more responsibility, but at least being able to like make sure where you're studying and like, your school system, it like accurately represented. The law class or whatever, uh, you, you don't get to vote. But if you take the class and you pass the class, you're allowed to vote at the age of 16. Right now, what do you think? If you think 16 year olds should be able to vote, please stand. All right, have a seat, please. If you think that 16 year olds should not be able to vote, please stand. Okay, because what happens a lot sometimes is especially if we are the only person sitting at our table or the only person in a group and we hold a point of view, we sometimes think we are crazy or the only people that feel that way. And so I want you to see that there are always other people out there that have similar opinions to you. So there are always people to search out um, if there are change that you want to make um, that you can always find people to do that. People should be able to engage with one another and hear each other, even if it is something that forms a kind of core belief. Students having the opportunity to engage in these things then opens them up to later discussions. And the only way to do that is provide them a space in which to engage safely in that learning. I think it's a method of discussion that students can build a lot of competency in and then really work on their own. So this is the first time that my class has done a SAC but it's always wonderful to hear the kinds of thinking that they do and the kinds of constructing that they do. So I really do think it's an easy entry level kind of discussion format. What was different about this kind of discussion, the SAC, is that I feel like everybody had the opportunity to express their opinion. Everybody had like the opportunity to be heard. Everybody's opinion was heard. No one was like shut down. I feel like as like, teenagers who are about to like turn into young adults in school I feel like that's the place where we could like see all the sides and come up with our own decisions Okay. All right. So why don't we take a couple of minutes to just see if there are any questions about structured academic controversy or any comments about what you saw and heard? Any well, that was really lovely to see. Um, I loved how articulate the students were about the benefits of using that particular method in comparison to doing a debate. Um, and uh, it was really lovely to see that excellent teaching modeled by that teacher too. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, uh, yes, I have just finished my PGCE with Queen's University Belfast, and that is uh -huh. why I'm here, loving this. Um, and yeah, my last, my final assignment there was on SAC so it was I was able to write quite um, considerably on it so it was absolutely fantastic to see it actually working there in a school so thank you very much. Oh good there are other videos like that one so if you're interested I can send them to you. Brilliant thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yes I'd just like to say that when you observed that those students were not new to this particular process or this pedagogic approach and you could see that they were very well versed so obviously the teacher had done quite a lot of work beforehand to get them to that sort of safe supportive environment in which they could discuss those things so you could see that the students were brilliant and the teacher as well thank you thank you yeah a lot of great work has been done in the Chicago public schools around this Christy? Um, I was, I was going to ask how much information is given to the students um, as reading so that they, they can, they've got a balanced set of views to kind of draw from or, or does the teacher pose the question and then they go away and research themselves without any, um, you know, 
any pointers in the right direction. So what, how does the teacher set this up? That's a great question. It can be done in a lot of different ways. And as a matter of fact, I appreciate the question because I wanted to say that what I found um, really powerful about what the teacher educators did, who I studied, was that they provided their pre-service teachers with an adaptable toolkit. And I'll be talking about that a little bit later. But I found that the pre-service teachers took the structured academic controversy and, and enacted it in very different ways. So it could be just you know, one article that represented different points of view that was distributed to the students. It could be more extensive. We'll be seeing a couple of examples, as a matter of fact, in a couple of minutes, two different approaches to SAC, um, shaped in part by the constraints that student teachers were working under. So it could be very involved and it could include students doing their own research, um, but it also could be very teacher directed and scaffolded. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions about structured academic controversy? So there's lots of other methods um, that people use to teach controversial issues. And I wonder whether um, any of you want to share your favorite method that you've used in the past. Are people familiar with the walking debate? Goes by different names. Um, some people call it four corners activity. It depends on how you structure it, but basically you're asking students to position themselves physically along a spectrum or in four corners of the room. Um, you give them a question um, like, Let's see, what would be a good controversial question? Looking back to some of the examples that you all came up with. So, um, well, let's take the question should, that was raging here in Berkeley last spring. Should we open schools now? Um, and you would have students line up along a spectrum from you know, absolutely yes to absolutely no and anywhere in between, or you could do strongly agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, strongly disagree in four corners of the room. And then students from those different positions would share their arguments behind their position. And uh, importantly, you would give students the opportunity to move from one position to another based on what they heard their classmates say, something that may have changed somebody's minds might get them to move. So that's, that's the walking debate. Other ones, line of agreement is, yeah. Um, yeah, oh, can I just, uh, yeah, one we, one we use at the Migration Museum that actually I once used as a citizenship teacher long time ago before I started this job is that um, we do a, a kind of silent, a silent conversation that, that's, that builds up with our visitors. It's, I think it's probably better over a few, a few lessons or a few weeks so it doesn't have to all kind of pile into that half an hour or an hour. Um, but we encourage visitors to the Migration Museum to reflect on our exhibitions by writing their questions um, to for each other on the outside of envelopes. Like maybe there's 20 envelopes you know, hung on the wall and then other people respond to those questions or respond to each other's responses, you know, write on each other's answers. And it just, it just grows. And so we've got a whole, we've got a whole um, exhibition about skin color and what does skin color mean and not. It's based on an art piece that we share. And the conversation that grew around that was, was amazing. And like a very, a bit of moderation is needed, I find, but generally actually it's like a really calm way of, of students having a chance to discuss things with each other without you having, without you leading it and, where they're all equally heard and have a chance to say something or not. And yeah, so I guess silent, silent debate, silent conversations, what it used to be called around the tables in classrooms, but this is on the wall and it's, as I said, grows, grows over weeks, so. Nice. Yeah, one of the teacher educators that I studied used silent conversation as one of the approaches. Anything else anybody wants to share? Another teacher educator who I studied actually created a simulation about a parading dispute in Northern Ireland where students were given different roles and they had to try to come up with a negotiation um, that would you know, regulate parading. 
Um, and it, that was very, very interesting. That's written up in the book. Um, another teacher educator actually had students look at historical sources kind of one by one to build up evidence around the question, what made reserve police officers massacre Jews during the Holocaust, during a particular event. And it was fascinating because students ranked factors that they thought were important in making those people shoot. And when they got more evidence, they changed their minds. So they went deeper and deeper into the question as they got more and more evidence. And then they looked at the outcomes of the trials that were held and did a walking debate on to what extent they thought justice was served. So lot, lots, yeah, Kirsty. Can you unmute? I'm not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, so we, we used a, a mock UN format so that students played envoys from different countries and they were talking about whether or not um, the Security Council should intervene in Syria. So, I mean, some of you may have used this. It's a reasonably old uh, resource now, unfortunately, but to actually distance themselves from their own feelings to be able to represent someone else was a really empowering um, thing for young people to do because suddenly they could, you know, they they could detach that, that they could depersonalize it and it actually helped them to really explore the different issues from different perspectives, you know, to actually not, you know, not feel personally uh, attached to the issue but to kind of look at it from somebody else's perspective uh, that was really powerful and I, I like I like that distancing technique mm -hmm. thank you for that yeah Zoe hi yeah I've done something similar um to the historian you were talking about I think when we looked at justice after the holocaust um, because obviously there's a distancing in terms of time, but also um, a distancing in terms of topic, because obviously with lots of contentious issues, emotions run quite strongly by taking it back a little bit. Um, they can they can view things. So the students looked at um, what uh, certain leading members of Nazi party had been accused of or were involved in during the Holocaust, and then what happened to them under the Nuremberg trials. And obviously some of them escaped um, and, and got through to sort of South America and some of them sort of even the lower ranking ones, guards and things had no sort of punishment and such. And it, it was quite difficult for them to attribute the idea of justice and retribution and things like that through the process. So um, that worked really nicely. And then they could start to see the more complex, complex issues of current conflicts and why you couldn't see an easy resolution to conflict and um, even in like Rwanda and we looked at trace through that as well so. That sounds amazing, thank you. Okay so we're going to build on this and go into the next activity which is looking at um, data from the student teachers, some findings that I think are really interesting and that I think um, you can connect to what's going on in your own schools. So I'm going to share my screen again. Oops, did not want to do that. Uh, hold on one second. There we go. Here we go. OK. So the second grounded theory that came out of my data analysis was adaptive uptake of pedagogical tools. So a little while ago, I said that all of the teacher educators provided their pre-service teachers with an adaptable toolkit of both conceptual tools and practical tools. And I found when I interviewed um, the, the pre-service teachers after their school placements that they had selected from this toolkit, things that they wanted to try and use in their um, student teaching experiences. And um, their uptake of these tools was adapted to their students. Um, and they taught many, many different kinds of students, um, the curriculum that they were given to teach, their own teacher identity and their proclivities and orientation towards teaching, 
um, the schools in which they were teaching, the school culture and the community, institutional constraints were a major influence. And then what was going on outside of the school, of course, was influencing all of those other contexts, um, like Brexit, for example. So what I'd like to ask you to do now in breakout groups once again is to read um, these very short vignettes from my book, Hard Questions, Learning to Teach Controversial Issues, and discuss them in your breakout groups. And then um, we'll do a little bit of debriefing afterwards. So let me just show you what these look like. So I actually have potential discussion questions for you to talk about. Um, what struggles do the student teachers report when trying to teach controversial issues? Oops. What supports and constraints influence their uptake of teaching controversial issues? This is super important in thinking about, you know, what makes it easier or more difficult for us as educators to do this work? And then I'd like you to apply it to your own school context. So what are the factors in your school that support you in teaching controversial issues? What would need to change in your school in order for this work to be supported. And of course, if you're not at a school, but in another educational setting, please you know, think about that as well. So I've got three vignettes. Um, Alex, it was from one university in Northern Ireland, and he's talking about his um, teaching and citizenship. Andrew is at a different university in Northern Ireland, and uh, he's adapting structured academic controversy. And Margaret is also from the second university in Northern Ireland, and she's doing a more extensive version, version of academic controversy. So I'm gonna stop the share so Lee can put us back in breakout groups. And why don't we take 13 minutes for that? Samantha, thank you for putting the link to the vignettes in the chat. They aren't expected to. Okay, are we all back? Looks like it. Terrific. So I would love to hear um, your reactions, your ideas. You know, what do these vignettes say to you about the uh, supports and constraints that shape teachers' ability to do this work? And how does that relate to your own context? I think that's probably the most important piece. Um, so uh, we were discussing Margaret, uh, who was the last case study, because we, we felt that we might not get through them all. So we thought if everybody else discusses the first ones and then we, if we get to the last one, that might be useful. Um, and we were talking about the way um, Margaret um, overloaded her students with a lot of text um, to process and synthesize. And that was perhaps a bit too much for them. Um, and also then that they would do a lot of that work in one lesson, they'd have homework, then they'd come into a lesson fresh to do the sack. But actually by that point, momentum might have been lost. Um, while also they didn't necessarily have enough time to react emotionally and have their emotions validated and explored and, and dealt with in some way because it's a really controversial topic. Um, so we were just saying that, um, that the student teacher needed to give it more time 
and also needed to know her students um, in order to, to, to actually know what they could access in, in terms of what she planned. That is such an interesting response. Thank you so much. I think it would be fascinating to juxtapose that with a reaction to the second vignette. And then I, I can explain why I put those two together. Um, anybody want to talk about your reactions to the second vignette? Andrew? I'll speak to the uh, time. I was with group five and um, we kind of divvied ours up. So that was mine to speak to. Um, what really stood out is um, the time constraint when you had engagement from students and engagements in subject matter and a strong debate and um, being limited by time, that that is definitely a constraint that as educators, you know, we have to grapple with and recognizing that if it's an important subject to your students, of course, you want to have more time for that, but it's a continual restraint we deal with. Thank you. Yeah, more time for citizenship. Um, so Margaret, the vignette that you read about Margaret happened in a politics class and she had, I think it was 65 minutes and then 35 minutes all in one week, two class sessions. And that was luxurious compared to what Andrew had. Andrew had one 35 minute period. And so what she could do was so much more extensive than what he could do. And so I really wanted to point to the role of institutional factors um, in either supporting or frankly undermining, you know, what teachers are able to do. So he, he did an amazing job of adapting the tools that he learned. He was very enthusiastic and did as much as he could, but it was limited compared to what Margaret was able to do. Anybody else have reactions and also uh, connections to, like I said, your own, your own context? So do you wanna do you wanna speak to Alex, the first vignette? I think Kirsty White had her hand up. She might be first in line, sorry. Oh, okay, thanks. Kirsty? Thanks, Zoe. And I was gonna relate to um, my own personal context. I've got uh, a class that's just um, finished their, their course and they are very adept at discussion and debate. They want to research things, they bring things in, they watch the news. And in, in absolute contrast, I've got a very different cohort in the year below. And those young people, they have to, they, they lack confidence in their own ability, but they also lack some really basic communication skills. So they don't listen to each other. They tend to just talk and no, they're not talking to anybody, they're just, they're just speaking you know and so with that group we're, we're in the situation um where alex is is that actually those skills need to be built up before they could get to a point where they can um, debate something you know like the collapse of stormont they need to be able to listen to each other they need to be able to work maybe in small groups in pairs first of all and look at sort cards or do a diamond nine so they decide how they feel about the, the issue. And, and, you know, that I think that's one of the biggest difficulties is in a group where their lower ability is to actually build um, skills to allow them to access, you know, the, the deliberative conversation later on. You know, you have to kind of put those steps in place as a teacher. And with only 40 minutes once a week, it's, it's difficult to do that. So um, I think, you know, that's an institutional thing, isn't it? But it's also looking at having to be adaptive to the needs of those particular young people. Great points. Some would argue that um, streaming should be disrupted. You know, that, that classes should be heterogeneous. That's a controversial issue, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I agree. I think there should be mixed ability because then young people hear that, you know, they're, they're their peers, but they're their peers from that have a different life perspective. And I think that's really important. You get that with mixed ability groups. So I, I agree with you there. 
I think it also points to the need for lots of coaching um, for student teachers who are put into that situation. They need a lot of support. Yeah. Uh, who's next? Zoe? Thanks. I, I just think with Alex as well, if I was working with him, I would kind of say, don't despair totally. The fact that you found out that they don't know anything is really valuable as a citizenship teacher and the fact that you realize that their communication skills are really poor is really important because for your future planning you can now think okay i'm gonna start every lesson with a news clip or a, a what do you think activity where they have to write down their response and you choose two or three to present it so you start building that foundation and then you can go back to the activity and I think sometimes you know training teachers in training when one thing doesn't work how they think suddenly it's a complete you know that's it they'll never touch that idea again when it's actually about those baby steps um, and obviously those young people haven't been exposed to the around the kitchen table talks about the news or you know whatever it may have been that some students have been and they haven't had the lower school input so the foundations from year seven to year nine so they're really it was asking a lot just to kind of throw them into that situation and as a as a novice teacher it's something that people need to become aware of and he's learned that now and hopefully wouldn't or she or Alex could be either um they've learned that now and they they could push forward with that um and, and move forward and hopefully we'll be able to build better for next time so I think that's just really important too that we all learn from these mistakes I certainly have absolutely and that's exactly the kind of coaching that I'm talking about uh Rudy, any other I think Emma was waiting to jump in sure. Yeah, I'm not seeing. Hello. Emma, yes, there you are. Sure. Hi, um, I find this interesting because I come from Northern Ireland and I teach in the, what you call the non-selective school, a secondary school where the children have not passed their um, transfer procedure, used to be called the 11 plus. So I could recognize immediately the type of children he was working with. I also think that the, um, the school had run down the status of citizenship by not, the children weren't teaching, being taught it in years eight and nine. So when they were 14 in year 10, and it was the bottom group, it was already the relevance of the subject had been undervalued and the children didn't have the vocabulary knowledge to, to make a, a decision or opinion about it. Whereas the young um, teacher thought that if it was on the news, everybody's heard of the collapse of Stormont. The children aren't a bit interested in politics in this country. Um, they'd rather play Xbox or things like that. So as Zoe was saying as well, if he'd introduced the subject and given different opinions, um, the children might have been able to formulate their own better. The other thing about a walking debate I've noticed is that sometimes young people follow their peers and just go to the part of the room their friends are going to, instead of actually confidently and bravely standing in another area of the room. Mm -hmm. Good point. Emily, were you gonna say something too? Okay. So I've just, I've got my eye on the time here. This is a really fabulous discussion. Um, and if we do have any time to come back to the question of, you know, your own context, I would love to do that. But I do want to show you some resources that I put together that you can take away with you. So I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Um, by the way, feel free to reach out to me if you want to follow up with any questions or feedback. Um, I am hopefully going to be coming over to your side of the pond sometime next year. Um, I actually got tickets for late September. I don't know. It depends on how the pandemic decides to play itself out. So it could be later next year. But I would love to, um, you know, connect with people who want to connect and also get your ideas about how to disseminate this work. I have a research communications grant from the Spencer Foundation. I'm actually part of a pilot cohort of grantees, and the idea is to get research 
out into the hands of non-academic audiences so that it can really have an impact instead of just you know circulating in the ivory tower. So I would love any ideas that you might have. And here are the resources. So I just put a whole bunch of things together in a Google Doc. Um, there's so much more. There's really been an explosion, I think, of uh, materials and resources for teaching controversial issues. But I um, categorize these uh, in general, general kinds of um, buckets. So there's books and articles and development, professional development packs. There's web pages and websites with lots of resources, podcast and video, and guidelines for discussion. So uh, we have five minutes left, and I am wondering whether there are any questions, any feedback, any final comments, whatever people want to offer at this point. And I have not been able to read everything in the chat, so I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, I have a question if nobody else. Uh, sure. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> um, I I am uh, leading a team of teachers that changes every year. Um, so the way PSHE, uh, my subject, is is timetabled means that the teachers change every year. And I was just wondering if you, if there is a particular um, like online uh, video or resource that you could recommend from that list or, or on top, top of your head, um, something that like if somebody were picking up the teaching of personal social health education um, needed to watch and they didn't have very much time, like is there something you can think of that I could recommend to them? I would love to run inset on it every year and that will obviously be something I campaigned for, but it's maybe not something that is on the horizon for this year. You know, Lee might be a better person to answer that question because I'm sure he's way more familiar with the curriculum than I am. I'll just say quickly, I posted some links in the chat earlier on. Um, one to a project at the Association for Citizenship Teaching that includes um, some short CPD videos aimed at non-specialists. That's under a project called the Deliberative Classroom, but also um, uh, the Five Nations held a conference with the theme of deliberation a few years ago, and uh, Leslie Emerson in Northern Ireland ran a workshop that uh, talked about, she, took, she called it political generosity, I've put the link in, but it actually included some of the stuff that Judy was talking about around the structured academic, whatever it's called, the SAC. <laughs> So she talked about some examples uh, and ran through an example. So I think her resources are there and you can just download them and use them in inset. Thank you so much. That's really helpful. Thanks, Lee. Anything else? Uh, if we had more time, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, the extent to which people do feel supported by school leaders and others um, and what might be getting in the way. So feel free to have that conversation with me later if you feel like reaching out through email. I'm always interested in the contextual factors that are going on in different locations. Oops, sorry about that. Well, it's been wonderful to be with all of you. This is really an amazing group of educators and uh, I always wish that we had more time, but this, is, this has been very rich. So thank you so much for all your participation. At the end of a long day, mine is just starting. <laughs> and it was a great way to start. So thank you.